my, my chapter did focus on agricultural resource uh, loss and abuse and degradation. Uh, and what the, the theme of the, of the chapter essentially is uh, that we need to be taking care of these resources because they are in fact the basis of our food supply. So we need to be working on, on paying much more attention to and taking much better care of resources that I, that I will focus on today, which are water, land, and a stable climate. And in each of those cases, uh, we are not doing a good job of taking, those, taking care of those resources. And in fact, uh, we are threatening the food security uh, uh, that uh, all of us depend on. So when we talk about uh, resource loss, um, and Gail, do you know anything about this? It's Excuse me for the, the interruption. What I was going to do is start actually with a case study, because I think a case study can help us, can help to ground us uh, in terms of the issues that we'll be looking at. And the case I'd like to look at, and now we can actually look at it, is, uh, is the case of California. Uh, it's a state, as you know, that's been in the news recently because of water issues. It's also the state where I happen to live, and so I do have a sense of of what is happening there. Now, why is this topic important? Uh, we've talked, of course, about the fact that it is the base of our food supply. But from an academic uh, and official perspective, uh, we can also note that the United Nations Environment Program, when it was listing emerging issues that we all need to be uh, 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 very concerned about, it ensured uh, that uh, foods, ensuring food security was ranked as number three by scientists and number two by major groups and governments. Um, so it is uh, obviously a very important uh, issue. And this is not going. Um, so let me tell you about California. Uh, California is in the third, uh, fourth year of a very, very severe drought. It's something that has really set back uh, the state uh, kind of thrown its back uh, back on its on its heels. Um, as you may know, uh, California relies on a couple of sources of water. Uh, one is uh, groundwater. Uh, another is snowpack from the Sierra Nevada mountains, uh, and the third, of course, is surface water. And what has happened this year is that the surface water uh, was had to be cut by 36 percent. So farmers have one third less surface water uh, to work with uh, last year than they, than they uh, were normally accustomed to. So what do you do if you're a farmer and you can't tap the river that's near you? Well, you go to, to the aquifer. Aquifers are supposed to be sort of an insurance uh, source of water. Uh, but what also has happened is that uh, in the past many years, even in years of good rainfall, we've had a situation where farmers are over pumping those aquifers. So they have not been uh, available uh, to, to supplement the surface water supply. The result of that, the t these two sources of water not being available, is that uh, agricultural land had to be fallowed uh, by about 5% uh, in California. So we're actually producing less food uh, this year because of this lack of water, because our back backup sources could not be used. I'll just skip this because this gives a sense of what's happening in California. If you look along the bottom, I'm not sure if you can see the bottom uh, axis, but it runs from October to May, which is the rainy season in California. And this shows uh, basically wet, average, and dry years. Uh, all these different lines are plotted from back to uh, 1895. And you can see that in the wettest years, we would have about 25 inches of rain per year in California in these, uh, these six months, uh, and in an average year, about 15, and in the driest years, around uh, five inches of rain per year. But you can see on the very bottom, the purple line there, it says 2013, 2014, which should actually also now be extended to 2015. Uh, you can see that we're well below even the driest years at about two or three inches per year. So we're way below uh, the amount of water that we need in California uh, to keep up the agricultural production uh, in addition to city and, 
and uh, industry uh, needs. So it's the worst drought. They were saying last year, 109 years. You keep hearing that, uh, that number go up. Uh, I've covered this, that groundwater cannot compensate, and that we've had about 5% of the state's uh, irrigated farmland been, has been fallowed. Now, the economic toll has been over $2 billion and over 17,000 uh, lost jobs. So it's not just an environmental issue, obviously. It's, a, it's an economic and uh, livelihood issue as well. So I said I'd be talking about water and land and climate change, and all three of these uh, are affecting California as well. So climate change is bringing about these droughts that jeopardize these water savings accounts that I've already referred to. So you can think of the water in aquifers underneath the farms as being a savings account. That's where we can go when we really need some surplus water. You can also think of glaciers on the top of the Sierra Nevada mountains as another reservoir, another savings account that's sitting up there because that is where our spring and summer water comes from. We get snow in the winter, it melts off in the spring and summer, and that is our water supply. And yet uh, the IPCC expects snowpack in California to decline by 12 to 40 percent by mid-century, uh, up to 80 percent by the end of the century. Uh, so this very, very important resource for us that sits in the mountains is largely disappearing. And we've certainly seen that uh, this year. Now the third resource, so we've talked about water and climate, the third resource that we are abusing in California is land. And we're losing land to urban development. Uh, most recently in 2008 to 2010, uh, the area of prime farmland that was lost to uh, urban and suburban development was equal to the area of three quarters of the city of San Francisco in just two years. In an era in which you might have thought that we'd be a little more enlightened about preserving our, our prime farmland, but we're losing it at a fairly rapid rate. So. <laughs> the mouse. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me just say this. What I'm going to say next is that these problems apply, not this problem. These, <laughs> these problems apply at the global level as well. Oh, click there. OK, great. Thank you. So let's look beyond California now. Let's consider the United States and, and the world. If we look at land loss uh, in the United States in just a 25-year period between 1982 and 2007, the United States lost 9 million hectares of prime farmland or of agricultural land. Uh, and that area is equal in size to the area of the state of Indiana. There are not equivalent figures globally. Uh, but we can talk about degradation of land globally. And the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations reports that between 15 and 24 percent of the world's land is degraded. Those are varying degrees of degradation. And of course, that affects the amount of uh, yields that you can get off of, uh, off of a hectare of land. We can also talk about grabbed land. Now, this is kind of a different category because we're not losing land. Uh, although at the national level, you can talk about losing land if your land is grabbed and taken by somebody from outside of your country. Uh, and what that off the form that that often takes is that governments or corporations or investors come into countries and are buying up, uh, investing, leasing land. Uh, to be able to use it for their own agricultural production. And you can see on this table at the bottom, 73 nations around the world have now experienced some form of land grabbing. And that amounts to about 36 million hectares. I must say that these figures kind of bounce around. There are some folks who put out much higher figures. But I'm going with a conservative estimate of 36 million hectares that are, uh, that are grabbed uh, farmland. And that's about the size of Japan. And that's over the last 10 years. Uh, farmland in, in the area of about uh, the size of Japan has been taken uh, in some countries by foreign entities. 
The investor countries uh, tend to be wealthy and in the north, and you can see that the United States is a leading uh, land grabber, if you will, land investor. Uh, and target countries uh, tend to be in Africa and in Asia. Now we can also talk about water scarcity, water scarcity globally. And as you probably know, agriculture is a big, big user of water, and about two-thirds of water withdrawals in most economies uh, go to agriculture. And with good reason, because th that tends to be very, very productive land, so that 16% of arable land in the world is uh, irrigated farmland, but it produces 44% of the world's food. So it really matters. If you can direct water uh, to a particular place at a particular time in terms of a field, you really get results. Uh, and it's, it's no accident that we use irrigation uh, as, as often as we can. But there's a limited potential to increase this irrigated area. And in fact, the FAO views water as the binding constraint for food production in the Middle East and North Afri Africa because it's not able to be used for irrigation uh, any longer, no, no increased irrigation there. We can talk about river basins. A lot of farmers get their uh, water from rivers. Uh, many river basins around the world are now closed, and that means that domestic and agricultural and industrial water needs compete with, ag uh, with ecological needs uh, for water. So we cannot expand the use of that water from those river basins. There was a study in 2012 that said that 400, of the 405 river basins in the world that constitute 75% of global irrigated area, or that contain that area, in 201, severe water scarcity was present for at least one month a year. And in 35 of those water basins, severe water scarcity was present for at least half of the year. And again, these are water basins from which uh, that contain a great, uh, the vast majority of the irrigated area in the world today. And of course now there's tension as well over the use of water in various places and I just mentioned one example here which is a dam that Ethiopia is building on the Nile River uh, which uh, Egypt is quite upset about because it could limit the amount of flow that makes it uh, north to, to Egypt. So these uh, water issues have a real geopolitical consequences as well. We can talk about aquifers that are increasingly drained at the global level. A 2012 study said that 20% of the world's aquifers are pumped faster than they are recharged. So again, this is supposed to be insurance money, or insurance water. This is supposed to be what we turn to as a second resort in terms of, of watering, and yet in 20% of cases, uh, we are pumping faster than they're recharged. There's an interesting satellite uh, system that the United States has called the GRACE uh, satellite system that is able from way up in space to tell how much water has been taken from under uh, a farm or, or in a particular region. And that uh, has been used to, in the Tigris and Euphrates basins, uh, has shown that they have lost water equal in volume to the Dead Sea and that 60% of that loss has been from overpumping. And GRACE has been operating only since about, I believe it's 2002. So th these losses that I'm describing have happened just in the last decade and a bit more. They also found similar depletions in India in a very severe way, North China, North Africa, Southern Europe, and in California in the United States, and also in the Midwest of the United States. And of course, climate change uh, will affect agriculture as well. We don't think of climate often, I guess, as a resource, but in fact, it's a very, very important resource when you're growing plants. You know, it's, it's vital. Uh, it turns out that changes in temperature and precipitation and carbon harm crops at the global level. At the global level, meaning there are places in the world where some of those changes will actually help production, but overall, uh, agriculture will be, uh, output will be harmed. 
The IPCC says that net yields of uh, agricultural crops could decline between 0.2 and 2.0 percent per decade. And that may not sound like a lot, but you have to look at that uh, stacked against a demand increase of 14 percent per decade that is expected. And it's important to say that this is quite different from the world that we have known over the last 50 years, where, where uh, yields were consistently uh, on the rise in most parts of the world. Here we're, we're describing a declining yield world. And it could be worse than these figures indicate. Uh, there's one uh, study that layered hydrological studies on top of climate studies and said that some of these losses could in fact double uh, over, uh, over the decades ahead. So the question is, why do we care about this? Why do we care about resource loss? I mean, after all, as I said, we've had such success with agricultural output over the last uh, 50 years or so, uh, two and a half to threefold increase in agricultural output since then. Well, the first reason is because we still have hungry people. Now, it turns out, of course, that hungry people today are not caused by resource loss. Uh, it's typically a political or an economic problem that causes people to be hungry. But resource losses could become an issue in the future in terms of driving hunger. But even without resource loss, we already have uh, 800 million people, one out of nine persons on the planet, who are chronically hungry. Another reason to care about resource loss is that growing prosperity in developing countries and elsewhere increases the demand for livestock products. So we know that as people get wealthier, they tend to want to eat more meat and, and uh, eggs and, and, and milk and other livestock products, all of which are grain intensive or can be grain intensive, depending how they're raised. And demand uh, has gone up steadily between 1961 and 2007, and we expect it to continue to. And one of the reasons for the increase, the steady increased demand, is that biofuels are now a factor in agricultural uh, production. So biofuels worldwide, or excuse me, in the US, eat up 40% of coarse grains of corn, for example. Goes, so 40% of our corn crop is going to make cars move. 50% of Brazil's uh, sugar crop and 80% of the European Union's oilseed production uh, go to the production of biofuels. The FAO has called biofuels a new market fundamental that drives up prices. And what I find probably most interesting about this topic now is that strategies for securing food may not be sustainable. So over the past 50 years, as we needed to provide more food for a growing population, we could not really expand uh, agricultural area that much. And we had to use a different uh, strategy, which was intensification. So we know that farmers boosted their yields and fishermen uh, used high-tech trawlers and aquaculture to increase their output. But there's an emerging strategy that I think is uh, perhaps too clever by half, and that is importing food. This uh, graph shows the Middle East and North Africa grain import dependence, and by that term I mean the share of the consumption in the Middle East and, and North Africa that had to be bought from abroad. You can see in the early 1960s, it was around 20% of their grain was uh, brought in from abroad, and uh, the last couple of years, it's hovered around 50%. So nearly half of, of what they eat comes from abroad. And it's important to note that there is a relationship between countries that are water scarce and countries that are import dependent. Of the 23 most water scarce nations in the world, for, for which we have uh, uh, import dependence data, those countries import an average of 58% of their grain. So as water becomes more scarce, we can expect uh, uh, import dependence uh, to increase. In Central America, we're also seeing uh, this is rising to 50% and above, the grain import dependence. In this case, though, it's a lack of land not so much a lack of water that's causing the problem. So again, resources coming into play again. I've got just a short amount of time. This, 
Uh, graphic shows countries that are dependent on imported grain and how they have increased over time. There were 11 countries in 1961 that imported all of their grain, 13 in 20, 2013. So not a huge increase in the number of countries that, that were dependent. But if you look down at the other levels, more than 50% and more than 25% dependent, you can see that there was a substantial increase in the number of countries uh, that depend on international markets. And the, the problem with that is, of, of course, twofold. One is that not everybody can go to international markets. We can't all be food importers. Somebody has to be actually make, growing the food and, 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 and exporting it. And as we can see, even a country that is as uh, rich in output, agricultural output, as the US could be having trouble in the future because of our own agricultural resource problems. The case of California, for example, uh, in the Midwest, where we uh, are overrunning, uh, over pumping aquifers there as well. So we need uh, an, an ethical governance around resource issues and around food. And I will simplify this very greatly just to say that I think we need a new ethic for food and agriculture that treats food as sacred and that treats agricultural resources as strategic. And there are roles for governments, industry, and the cooperative sector uh, in this effort. So the government uh, is needed especially for the heavy lifting to protect farmland through easements and, and purchases, uh, zones around cities. Uh, Portland is, a, is an example. I understand uh, Toronto is another example uh, where dr lines have been drawn around those cities and we cannot allow those cities to, to grow beyond them. And we need programs to prevent degradation. We need to increase water productivity, crop shifting away from thirsty crops, for example. Um, assisting poor farmers with efficient irrigation technologies, and I'll have an example of that maybe even the Q&A. And water footprint benchmarks for crops. So this graph, or this table shows uh, various crops, the total, total water that's used for each of those crops globally, and then what the percentage of that water that we could save in the last two columns if, we, if farmers were operating in the top 10th percentile of efficiency or the top 50th percentile of efficiency. Bottom line, go to the bottom line. Uh, and it says here that we could save 52% of the water used on these crops if all farmers were operating at 10%, uh, the 10th percentile uh, of water efficiency, 25% if we were at the 50th. In other words, if we were using best practices, we could save a ton of water, is what the bottom line is there. We'll need to enshrine a right to food. Uh, this is an idea that goes back to the United Nations uh, uh, Declaration on Human Rights, but is something that the FAO has picked up uh, in the last few years, uh, where, where nations have a, an obligation to provide a right to food for their uh, people. And if all of this fails, uh, if all of this fails, and this is my really optimistic uh, piece here today, <laughs> we actually have three very large resource reservoirs, or food reservoirs, I guess I should say, that we could look at to help us feed a growing population. One is biofuels. We've already seen how much uh, grain they use. Food waste. Anybody know how much food in the world is wasted every year? I'm hearing 40%. Uh, uh, what I read is 33%, about a third of the world's uh, of the world's food is wasted. That's either at the farm or at home or somewhere in between. And then, of course, meat consumption, to the d degree that we're doing it excessively, uses a ton of, of grain as well. So I think I will, uh, I will stop there because I think I'm over time. Uh, and I will just sum up by saying demand for food is up, agricultural resources are abused, and nations are turning to international markets, which may not be the, the best strategy for everybody to be, to be going after. We need a food and agricultural ethic that treats food as sacred and agricultural resources as critical. Thank you very much. So I stay here.
Okay. Well, thanks very much, Gary. I think you, you laid out a rather comprehensive and compelling picture, and I think you gave us a bit of food for thought. <laughs> if I can stay with the, uh, with the theme here. So we have, um, well, normally five minutes, but let's see how it goes. We can, we can go a little over, I think. We have about five, 10 minutes for questions and comments, and I see two hands, three hands up already. Uh, sir, right here. Gary, I just want to take you back to your use of the term land grabbing. Sounds like you believe we should be very concerned about that. And I would just ask that you unpack that a little bit more because it doesn't seem like that's actually uh, equivalent to losing land to agriculture necessarily. Um, it doesn't sound like it's degraded land necessarily. One man's land grab could be another man's foreign investment in agricultural production. Um, so given, yes, the potential risks to indigenous populations, what really is the concern about uh, land grabbing and really does, doesn't the answer depend on a more granular analysis of ecosystem services gained or lost with such land? Mm. Interesting. Um, excellent question. Thank you so much for bringing that up because there is a lot to unpack there. Um, it is true that land grabbing does not result in a net loss of agricultural land. It does not necessarily in, uh, result in degraded land. Both of those points are, are well taken. Um, but what it can do in many cases is take land that might otherwise be used for uh, uh, small-scale agriculture and and use it for different purposes. So there's a social uh, issue that I think needs to be looked at in, in land grabbing. Um, uh, there's one other point I was gonna make there. I'll, I'll come back to that. But yes, it's, it's, it's a very good point because, oh, oh, the other point was that agriculture suffers from a lack of investment you know, around the world. It has for many, many years. Um, so one would think that, well, gosh, if folks are willing to invest, uh, you know, maybe this is a good thing for agriculture. And it might be, but it, it really depends on how that investment is used, and a more granular approach you know, would help us to understand that. But I think the fact that, that land grabbing really started to appear when prices went up, and it was, it was regarded as an investment opportunity more than any sort of a development kind of initiative, I think really makes us need to look at it very critically with a critical eye. But there may be cases of, of land grabbing that in fact are, are helping an area, but I don't think we can assume that. Okay, okay thanks Gary. Yes, go ahead. You mentioned uh, biofuels in reference in relation to, to food, and I think you're, you're right that we need to make food the priority and make the food system sustainable. I think it's gonna be really important for us to recognize that when we grow enough protein to feed the people in the world, that we get more carbohydrates and fats than we can consume. Plants store solar energy in those, and, and uh, so actually I think there's a, there's a really important thing to understand there about how biofuels work with the food supply, because they can be one of our biggest opportunities to, to mitigate, mitigate greenhouse gases. Uh -huh. I'll take your word on that for now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't have a lot of background in um, uh, you know, the, the full comprehensive impact of, of biofuels, but it is in fact the case that there is a lot of grain that's going to, uh, to fuels that is not fueling human beings, and that's, that's the only point. Right. But I would be concerned about the, you know, grain is not an inconsequential part of our diets. It's a huge part of our diets. It's where most of our calories come from. Uh, so if we're getting into a situation where we're limiting the amount of grain uh, that can go to people, it's, it's, it's a red flag, or it's a yellow flag anyway. Ed Barry? Yeah, uh, Ed Barry with the Sustainable World Initiative. Uh, Gary, thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, I'm a little concerned about your framing of it as scarcity. Wouldn't it be more appropriate in today's world to frame it as an imbalance between uh, 
total human demands and what the planet can actually support. And I go back to Garrett Hardin saying, we don't really have shortages, we have people longages or human society longages, if you will. Mm -hmm. Isn't there some call now for a new ethic which has to do with the scale of our collective human endeavors relative to all other species in the planet? Yeah. Thanks. No, I think it's, I think it's a, a good point, Ed. I don't think you can look at the Middle East, uh, North Africa, and look at the water uh, scarcity issues that they have there and not take population into account. I mean, it's, it's very clear that there's, there's the number of human beings relative to the resource base there is large. Um, but I wouldn't always want to frame it that way because, as you, as you know, in the population world, uh, there are many political issues. There are many political and economic reasons often why people don't have enough. Uh, and it may not be a question of merely too many human beings, too many mouths to feed. And I think I would look there first, actually. Uh, and, and very shortly thereafter, look at the population question. Because I think, I think politics could solve a lot of these, these issues. Uh, but eventually, population growth uh, would kick in as well. And, and as I say, in many regions, already is kicking in. So it is, I'm not dismissing the, the importance of population. I'm just saying that if we automatically go there as our first uh, sort of response, I think we have you know, we have an issue because we're overlooking political questions that we probably should be looking at. Great. Um, we can probably squeeze in one or two more questions. So, sir, right, you? Thank you. Mike McCracken from the Climate Institute. Um, you basically talked about it as sort of a gradual trend that one is, is facing. But there's an awful lot of concern in the climate community about increasing climate extremes and intensities of things. And given that there's only a few countries in the world that really export most of the grains that countries um, import, that 100 or 150 countries import, um, all you need is, a, is an extreme event in a couple of those grain things simultaneously. And that basically has the potential for drawing economic resources toward food and out of the rest of the economy toward an economic collapse, which is what I think there's actually increasing concern about rather than this gradual trend that will mm. we'll, we'll get some sudden change. Could you sort of comment on how resilient the system might be to, to sort of a couple of point failures yeah. of crops? Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, you know, I've just come from California where our governor has just said that we all need to, we all are required to reduce our water use by 25%. And that has never happened before in California. We've had voluntary, you know, calls for voluntary reductions. But this feels like a game changer in my state. And it's getting national attention uh, as well. And it feels to me like the kind of thing that might be that point intervention, uh, that point occurrence that really is waking people up. It's not the same kind of consequence that I think you're pointing to, uh, where things could collapse because of it. I actually would be more hopeful that we Californians will become much more rational about our water use now and, and help to preserve our capacity to, uh, to, uh, to grow food. But that's, your, your question is one reason that I included toward the end those three reservoirs of, of, uh, of food, you know, uh, biofuels, uh, meat production or meat consumption and uh, uh, food waste, food waste, thank you. Uh, because it seems to me that that does provide some elasticity to the system. Uh, but th those are all political questions as well. So that elasticity has to, be, has to be put into play by a politics that's really going to take these issues seriously. And I am not here to say that that's going to happen. Great. Okay, we have time for one more. I think there was somebody on my left. Yes, go ahead, sir. Derry Allen from EPA. Uh, I think your description of many of the threats to food security was quite good. Uh, and you waited, though, right to the end to talk about food waste. And uh, you mentioned it again just a moment ago. Um, when I look at the different issues that you described and think about, well, what does it take to do something about those? Um, uh, I keep coming back to food waste, uh, and I was wondering if you could discuss that in the context of, okay, uh, uh, perhaps 
if we didn't waste approximately a third or more of our food, uh, uh, that, that, that could be just huge in, in many ways. But uh, how difficult do you think that is as a route to food security compared to some of the other routes that uh, uh, might be suggested by other parts of the problem as you described it? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good question. And, uh, you know, food waste is, is a really interesting topic. As we said, about a third of the world's food is wasted. Some of that happens at the, at the farm level. That tends to be in developing countries uh, where maybe the, the techniques that are being used aren't as efficient, and so you're losing, you're losing food there, or the, the distribution systems are not uh, as sophisticated as they could be to preserve food along, along the way. In countries like ours in, and in the North in general, food tends to be wasted at home. Uh, but there are a number of really interesting innovations uh, that I think can be used to help reduce food waste. And sometimes, some of them are very micro level. So some universities in the United States now, if you go to their cafeteria to eat, you don't get a tray. Because the idea is that people who have trays load up their trays with lots of food and then waste a lot of it. So you have to carry the food that you're going to eat back to your table. And you know, again, a very small example, but it's a mindset shift that I think is needed to help us think of food as a really, really valuable commodity. Um, that's, that's just one example. Um, there was a picture I didn't have time to show, uh, a guy who was riding from, I think, Madison, Wisconsin last year to New York City on his bicycle. And he was not taking any food with him, and he was not taking money for food. Right, so he was riding all the way across the U.S. to see if he could feed himself. And all he had to do was dumpster dive behind supermarkets at every city that he stopped in. And he, and he, takes, he arrays all of this food out in a park in the city. And a picture of himself with all this food, it's really quite staggering to see the amount of food and the quality of food. This isn't rotting food. This is cereal boxes you know, full of cereal that haven't been opened that maybe their due date has passed. Uh, and, and there are economic uh, reasons for why uh, groceries will get rid of some of their food. We need to turn around those incentives so that, again, we're thinking of food as sacred. We want to preserve the f uh, food and the food supply. I should just mention that at EPA, we see this uh, as, as a waste problem, too, is that, that there is a lot of waste uh, that must be dealt with. So that it's become uh, a good strategy to uh, go after some of what you're talking about and, and say, uh, how can we help to see that some of the food that might otherwise be dumped uh, actually gets to hungry people who aren't getting that food? Right, right, exactly. Because as I say, this is not second-rate food in a, in a lot of cases. It's, it's good food. Great. Well, thanks so much, Gary, for the presentation and the answers to the questions. And I want to thank everybody for your questions as well.